Those of you playing old DOS games will probably run into a variety of display adapter situations, so let's talk about them so you know how to deal with them. The monochrome display adapter and Hercules graphics card were two competing formats way back in the early 80s for high resolution monochrome displays. However, you're pretty much never going to see MDA support in a DOS game. The reason for this is because the MDA was not able to address its individual pixels and was limited strictly to text display. The Hercules graphics card, however, did have a 720x350 monochrome graphics mode, making it very high resolution for its time and a very attractive alternative, because a lot of games in the 80s and early 90s supported this card. Granted, graphics could be a little dizzying on it, but the card used special memory mapping so that other graphics cards could easily be used alongside it, allowing for easy dual monitor setups. But some of the later DOS games, such as MechWarrior 2, actually send data to the HGC memory area, so if you have such a card installed with a monitor attached, you can see debugging information on your second screen. The Color Graphics Adapter was released roughly around the same time as the Monochrome Display Adapter, and while it doesn't have anywhere near the same resolution, it supports color. Specifically, the card officially supported a 16 color 80 by 25 text mode, a 320 x 200 4 color mode, and a 640 by 200 2 color mode. With some hacking of the text mode though, it was possible to create a 160 by 100 16 color mode, though I don't actually own any games which took advantage of that. The 4 color mode was unique in that you actually had two different palettes of three three colors to choose from, and then the fourth color, usually black or blue, could be changed to any of the 16 colors the card could display. Almost every game made in the 80s and a few in the early 90s supported CGA graphics. A few games also supported a special composite color mode, since connecting the CGA card to a standard television monitor causes pixels to be displayed much differently than you would expect to see. Approaching the mid-80s, a new computer came out from IBM called the PC Junior, which was marketed to compete with other low-cost home computers of the time, such as the Commodore 64. However, the PC Junior was more expensive, not fully compatible with other IBM systems, it was pretty much a flop. However, it did have a number of features not normally seen in PCs, such as a three-voice sound system and an advanced graphics card capable of 320x216 color graphics and 640x204 color graphics. These features would roll over into one of Tandy Corporation's first PCs, also known as the Tandy 1000, and later Tandy systems would also include a 640x216 color mode. Since these Tandy systems sold relatively well in the 80s, a lot of 80s games supported the Tandy graphics standard, but since the standard was superseded by EGA extremely quickly, very few games in the early 90s would continue to offer Tandy support. The Enhanced Graphics Adapter was the first big step towards providing PCs realistic color and graphics. The EGA card supported 16 colors on screen at once out of a possible 64 colors total, decided upon using 2 bits per color channel, red, green, and blue. The EGA card also supported three resolutions, 320x200, 640x200, and 640x350. Now each of these resolutions had good reasons for existing, but the 640x350 mode made for one of the first consumer level video cards to support high resolution color graphics. EGA was well supported during the 80s and early 90s, and a lot of games made for the 640x350 mode have a very unique feel, since many such games neglected to take this unique aspect ratio into account, meaning they look pretty nice on today's widescreen monitors. The Multicolor Graphics Array was IBM's first step towards the VGA standard that would prevail for many years. The MCGA was never released as a separate card, but was instead a built-in chipset for some of the first IBM PS2 computers released, not to be confused with the Sony PlayStation 2. The MCGA standard is fully backwards compatible with CGA, and also slightly forwards compatible with VGA under the right circumstances, but not compatible with the EGA standard. This meant systems equipped with only MCGA chipsets couldn't run EGA games, and this be annoying considering the MCJ was capable not only of a 640x482 color mode, but also a 320x200 mode capable of showing 256 colors on screen at a time, out of a possible 262,144 combinations, all made possible using 6 bits per color channel, red, green, and blue. MCJ is important in providing the first consumer level 256 color display mode, though other 256 color display adapters were already available on commercial level systems.
This is the standard that stayed around the longest. The video graphics array was one of the most programmable and one of the most backwards compatible standards ever put into use. VGA cards were backwards compatible with all CGA, EGA, and MCGA modes, and also introduced a 640x480 16 color mode. On top of this, the VGA chip could easily be programmed to support graphics potentials not originally considered, including a doubled vertical resolution of 320x400 with 256 colors, 320x240 with 256 colors to match the aspect ratio of 640 by 480 or even 360 by 480 with 256 colors, which is considered to be the highest resolution 256 color mode that can be safely displayed on an old non-multi-sync monitor. These specially tweaked resolutions are frequently referred to as Mode X, and while not too terribly supported, they do pop up in a number of games. The VGA 640 by 480 mode would remain a standard fallback resolution for Microsoft Windows all the way up to and past Windows 98. Granted, it was difficult to make viable games for the 640x480 16 color mode, so most games made to use VGA graphics would opt for the lower resolution 320x200 256 color mode. Things get a little hazy following the VGA standard. By the early 90s, many companies were now developing their own special graphics cards and graphics chipsets, meaning that in order to use resolutions and capabilities beyond the VGA standard, your software had to support the specific graphics card that would be installed in the person's system. And not every company making these cards were forthcoming with the details of how to program for them. Any resolution that superseded the VGA capabilities was loosely referred to as being Super VGA. Eventually, the Video Electronics Standard Association also known as VESA, would come along to try and unite these companies to form some form of standards beyond VGA that everyone could program for. It took a while, but eventually the VESA standards took hold, initially allowing for much higher resolutions of 800x600, 1024x768, and 1280x1024, all using 8-bit, 15-bit, 16-bit, and 24-bit color potentials, limited only by the amount of memory on the video card itself. The VESA standards would eventually expand, allowing for lower resolutions to use color depths higher than 8-bit, and to allow for much more variation in resolution, including support for most of the common tweaked Mode X video modes. As far as DOS games are concerned, the standards you're going to run into the most are CGA, EGA, and VGA. As of this moment, DOSBox is capable of handling all of the standards that I've mentioned, including a few special non-VESA Super VGA modes, specifically the ones for Tseng Labs ET3000 and ET4000 graphics cards, as three graphics cards, and Paradise graphics cards. Keep in mind that the modes you choose will inherently determine which video modes will work and which won't. For example, if you set your machine type as Tandy, none of the EGA VGA or SVGA modes are going to work, but you'll still have CGA support, whereas the Tandy graphics mode doesn't work on pretty much all of the other settings. Choosing the various display modes is neat for seeing just what modes a game will support, and sometimes you may be surprised to find performance differences or other differences, even if the mode you choose looks identical to a different supported mode. Such as in the DOS version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where the Tandy and EG modes do look identical, but in the Tandy mode your turtle's bandana is always blue for some reason. Anyways, that's all I got to say on the subject, so stay tuned for episode 21 of Ancient DOS Games, where I'll be taking a look at an old, independently made platformer that saw an unlicensed NES port. If you think you know what game that is, send your guests to adg at pixelships.com, and stay tuned to see if you got it right.